Thank you, Anthony, and thank you for the invitation. It's certainly the first uh, multidisciplinary meeting covering this type of topic that I've ever been really aware of, truth be told. So what we've heard a, a number of times that there really haven't been any approved uh, systemic therapies for ocular melanoma. And uh, conversely, we've had really quite transformative advances for cutaneous melanoma. So what I thought, what I've been asked to speak about today is is to cover really the advances in immunotherapy that we've seen in cutaneous melanoma and perhaps what we can learn uh, and what it can inform us as far as ocular melanoma is concerned. So this is my prologue slide. So this is essentially a synopsis of really where we've come with immunotherapy in melanoma. And it's really, you can see the, each of these dates is, is uh, refers to uh, a time point where there's been an FDA approval for a particular compound. So prior to 2011, we did have access to immunotherapy for cutaneous melanomas, but really they weren't proven to, to extend survival. So we had adjuvant interferon and interleukin-2 in the 1990s, and at that point in time, the median overall survival was in the nine-month zone. But you can see very quickly, with the first with the approval of an anti-CTLA-4 compound called epilimumab in 2011, that median overall survival extended modestly to 10 to 11 months, but with the subsequent approvals of PD-1 targeted therapies in 2014, that's really quite jumped quite markedly from this initial baseline to 24 to 40 months. And with the newest combination of CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 therapy, we're now looking at a median overall survival of greater than 48 months for combination treatment. So this has really been what's been happening in the cutaneous melanoma field. So what I'm going to talk about today will cover three main Topics. One is an overview of these advances, with particularly the immune checkpoint inhibitors for cutaneous melanoma, and then looking at the various biomarkers that might help us to predict why certain melanoma subtypes respond how they do and what we can infer about uh, immunotherapy for UMVL melanoma from, that, uh, from those biomarkers, and then what information we do already have for immunotherapy in UVL melanoma. So what are immune checkpoints? So immune checkpoints uh, the, uh, are in, uh, path, signaling pathways that are involved in, in down-regulating activated T cells. So, and there are two checkpoints that are commonly targeted for the, uh, in current generation immunotherapies, the first being CTLA-4, which is involved in early T cell activation uh, between activated T cells and antigen-presenting cells. And the drug that targets that, uh, which I've already mentioned, is epilimumab. There was another agent which, is still, which was developed for melanoma called tremolimumab, but that's uh, now being, uh, I guess it wasn't successful in some of its early trials and, and is, is not really in use in melanoma very much anymore. And then the second pathway is this PD, PD-1 and PD-L1 pathway, which is uh, seen in, in late uh, T cell activation and really is occurring at the level of the, in the tumour microenvironment between the T cells and, and the tumour cells or, or associated uh, immune cells. So perhaps this pathway is, can, can be considered to be a lot more specific to anti-tumour activity and we've got two compounds in that, working in that space in which are predominantly melanoma in the volumab and pembrolizumab. So this, is, this single slide kind of gives a synopsis of re really the sequential development of these immunotherapies. Uh, so this is a four-year outcome from a study which compared three types of immunotherapy, so single-agent epilimumab versus a, a PD-1 therapy, so in this case in the volumab, but pembrolizumab and the volumab can be considered roughly interchangeable, and then the combination of a CTLA-4 and a PD-1 therapy. And I've got here a historical control with figures coming from the original phase three study, which led to the uh, approval of epilimumab. I put the benchmark survival figures here for DTIC. So prior to the to the approval of epilimumab, you can see here your median overall survival was about nine months with in, in the pre-immunotherapy era, and long-term survival was sitting about 36%. But we can see with the first generation che immune checkpoint inhibitors, we had a modest increase in overall response rate. Um, but the, what really stood out with the immunotherapies is just how durable these responders are. And this translates into quite significant improvements in long-term progression-free and overall survival over historical benchmarks. With the uh, subsequent development of anti-PD-1 therapy, both in the, way, in the volumab and pembrolizumab, 
we saw with this more tissue specific increase in immune response, ob the objective response rates are significantly higher. Um, very long duration of control, which was not reported at this four year time point. Um, and again, the changes in progression free survival and long term median, uh, long term overall survival, again, uh, significantly improved. And what, what we're seeing with all these immunotherapies is perhaps a plateau in the survival curve beyond 36 months uh, with data for ipilimumab extending out to 10 years, which suggested that you hadn't uh, died of your melanoma in the first three years, that there was a very low likelihood of that happening in the subsequent 10 years. And then the most uh, aggressive type treatment, which is a combination of these two uh, path targeting these pathways, again, incrementing the response rate again with very long periods of disease control. Uh, but at the expense of significant grade three, four toxicities. And most of these toxicities are related to an autoimmune type reaction, so uh, commonly skin rashes or diarrhea and, and, and uh, inflammatory reactions within the endocrine organs. So that's, that's where immune checkpoint inhibitors has led us from the chemotherapy era up until now. So what I want to touch on is now is biomarkers, and you've heard that there are, I guess, in terms of, of melanoma and entering a period of personalised medicine, how uh, certain genomic features can predict very reliably for things such as uh, inhibition to BRAF and MEK. So B, the, apart from immunotherapies, the other standout advances in melanoma treatment has been these targeted therapies targeting BRAF mutations uh, in cut particularly cutaneous melanomas. The Biomarkers for immunotherapy are not as black and white as that for targeted therapies. However, they are still extremely informative. Um, and although none of these have, been, have made their way into clinical use, probably mainly be because the incremental benefit of each generation of immunotherapy has been so much above what has come before it, that even where we have a biomarker that may predict for a slightly higher response rate, the, the new generation treatment has, has generally been, uh, still remains superior to what has come before it. Um, a lot of really interesting uh, biomarkers here, some which are uh, fairly well validated, some which are emerging and some which are looking really uh, interesting. So you would have you know, heard about a lot of interest in how the microbiome can inf in impact on, on the um, immune response but also things like interferon gamma signaling in the tumour. Um, I'm going to touch on just three biomarkers today, which is pdl one expression, the tumour mutational burden, and site of organ involvement, mainly because these are things that we can, we've got good surrogates for in terms of melanoma subtypes and that have a significant impact on how we can understand immunotherapy in uveal melanomas. So, Tumor mutational burden, we've heard a bit about from Nick's uh, talk earlier today, but essentially tumor mutational burden is the number of, of, of mutations across the, the genome for any particular tumor type. And a higher amount of somatic mutations is, ref is associated with a higher purport a number of, of neoantigens and how recognizable a tumor might be to the immune system. So, a high tumor mutational burden has been associated with an increased response rate to immune checkpoint inhibitors across a range of tumor types. And you can see here from this study from Goodman and all, and I've just pulled out the non-melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer uh, graph here, that those where the tumor mutational burden is high, they tend to do a lot better than where the tumor mutation burden is low, both in terms of response rates and progression-free survival. And many people have seen this graph before, which graphs essentially the, the number of the median or the scatter of the number of mutations across a range of tumor types. And we find that these mutations here, which commonly have a strong uh, carcinogen associated with it, such as UV radiation or tobacco smoke, these are the ones which are more likely to respond to immunotherapy and be associated with uh, drug approvals. And then with, if we look at how this impacts within certain tumor types, so this is within melanoma itself, Again, looking at data from the Checkmate 067 study, which is that study which we saw earlier, that those patients who were classified as having a high tumor mutational burden versus a low tumor mutational burden do better across every single treatment arm with significant improvements in both progression-free survival, which is not shown here, but overall survival in, in this particular graph. 
The second biomarker that I want to focus on is PDL1 expression. So this happens in the tumor microenvironment, <laughs> and it makes sense that if we're targeting, we've got an anti-PD1 therapy that uh, tumors that express the the ligand, um, and therefore suggests that they need to to uh, that they're under immune pressure, and in response to that, they're expressing the ligand to suppress the immune system. They're the ones which are more likely to respond to anti-PD1 therapy. There's been some issues with how we assess PDL1 across various clinical trials. There's a lack of uh, standardization. Cutoffs, which are very uh, range quite widely. So we use 50% for lung cancer, but in melanomas, it's usually 1 to 5% is considered either to be positive or negative. And then, of course, within the tumor itself, there can be quite heterogeneous expression and dynamic expression. So PDL1 expression is one of those very gray kind of biomarkers. You can see in melanoma how uh, in this pembrolizumab study, Keynote 006, those tumors that were strongly, which expressed even 1% of PDL1, responded much, uh, much more, uh, had a much uh, significantly improved objective response and median progression free survival and overall survival compared to those that were negative. However, um, in all cases, even those even negative cases did better with pembrolizumab over ipilimumab, and then in the 067 study, uh, I guess the main finding here was that uh, that within the arms treated with single agent PD1 or combination treatment, perhaps the apps the, the the benefit was not as ne the or the benefit seen with combination treatment was not as marked with those tumors which were PD-L1 positive, suggesting that they obtain majority of their benefit from anti-PD-1 anti -PD therapy alone compared to those that were PD-L1 negative, where there was a uh, much more significant improvement in the combination. And the last biomarker that I want to touch on is site of metastasis. And it's been well recognized that patients who have liver metastases do significantly worse with immunotherapy um, than those that do not have liver metastases. And why this is so is not entirely clear. So this is data from the MIA group, which show that if you have a liver metastasis in the context of melanoma and you're treated with immunotherapy, you do significantly uh, worse than if you do not, uh, whereas that finding does not hold true for targeted therapy. And in this particular study, they and in previous studies, they've found that this is not just a local effect within the liver, but this is associated with systemic differences. So with the, in distal sites outside of the liver, they do find that the presence of liver metastases are associated with uh, uh, reduced TIL infiltrates, and then there's altered systemic cytokine signaling. So there is either something, uh, I guess, associated with the tumor itself, which allows it to metastasize to the liver, or in response to the actual presence of metastasis, there is some kind of systemic change. So why is this important? This is important, I guess, because it helps us really to see how different melanoma subtypes might re respond to immunotherapy. So standard cutaneous melanomas, um, I guess, sit in the middle here, but we can see that desmoplastic melanomas, which belong to a, a, a type of melanoma which is uh, commonly seen in the el elderly people in sun-exposed skin, has a very str strong UV mutation signature, a very high tumor mutational burden, and a very strong pd one staining. And these type of melanomas respond incredibly well to PD-1 therapy. So as opposed to the standard 40% response rate, their response rate is up in the 70% range. Whereas mucosal melanomas and acorn melanomas tend to have a much lower tumor mutational burden, lower pd one signature, and have a lesser response to PD-1 therapy. Now we don't have any phase three data for uveal melanomas, but what we can see, we can infer from what we know about the biomarker characteristics of uveal melanoma, and as we've heard, these type of uh, melanomas have very low rates of mutation. So this is the median rate of mutation. You can see that only one, a median of, of one mutation per megabase, very low pdl one signaling, suggesting that these tumors aren't under immune pressure uh, requiring them to express pdl one they do seem to express other, uh, have upregulate pathways for other immunosuppressive pathway, um, pathways such as IDO1 and TIGIT. Um, and 
nearly 90% of uveal melanomas associated with liver metastases, and not unsurprisingly, in the, in, in the studies that we do have of anti-PD-1 therapy, the response rates are incredibly low, certainly less than 10%, uh, and it's not clear whether there's any significant impact on progression-free survival. So, the, what I want to talk about last is what we do know about immune checkpoint inhibitors and immunotherapy in general in uveal melanoma. Um, we know that metastatic uveal melanoma generally has a poor prognosis, and again, there are no currently approved systemic therapies. We've got some historical benchmarks from uh, various meta-analyses looking at what we should be aiming to exceed in order to get a promising signal for uveal melanomas. This, this COJA uh, meta-analysis looked at 29 phase two trials across both chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and targeted therapies. And in, as, as we saw from uh, John's talk earlier today, the response rates are generally less than 10%, median progression-free survival of around three months, and median overall survival of about 10 months. Um, and we don't really have any strong phase three data for immune checkpoint inhibitors in metastatic uveal melanomas. What we do have is some phase two data with anti-CTLA-4 uh, monoclonal antibodies. There are three prospective phase two studies. Um, and across these three studies, one by the uh, Spanish melanoma group, DCOG, and uh, Anthony was the first author of this particular study with trimulimumab, there was only one objective response across these three studies out of a total of 96 patients. So really quite disappointing activity with anti-CTLA-4 um, monoclonal antibodies. Looking at anti-PD-1 therapy, there has been one phase two study uh, which has been published. This was a single site study which was run out of Vanderbilt University Medical Center and they actually closed their study, unfortunately. So this was one of the only phase two studies that was running with anti-PD-1 therapy and it was closed because they failed to accrue significantly. So it was open over a two year period of time and during that time they only managed to accrue five patients. So that just highlights the importance of how uh, collaborative groups are really required to do effective research in these rare cancer spaces. It's hard to really predict you know, what the true response rates are with such a low number in this study. Uh, there was one CR, very durable CR, 25.5 months. Um, you know, we don't have good biomarkers, again, for uveal melanoma, but I guess maybe this is one of those type of cancers, uh, uveal melanomas that express, had a high mutation signature that Nick mentioned earlier. Um, another case with the stable disease. We do have a number of retrospective series. This is the largest retrospective series. So they looked at um, 50, 58 cases treated over nine different hospitals in the United States, and they found that they only had two responses. So again, yeah, response rate in the single digits with very little change above what we would consider historical benchmarks for median progression free survival or overall survival. How about the combination? combination treatment. This study from the uh, Spanish group was only published uh, in February of this year. So they looked at, they had 52 patients treated with a fairly standard combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab. They had a response rate which was you know, above what we've seen with the previous treatments. Six out of 50 patients, so 12% of patients responded. A good proportion of people had long, stable disease. They didn't really characterize, this is their best response, so this might have only been six or 12 weeks in duration, the median progression-free survival hasn't changed too much, perhaps a little bit longer. Um, so the historic benchmark being about 10 months here, extension of median overall survival, um, but significant toxicity. Um, so the question is whether this is, you know, whether this response rate is really going to justify that rate of, of toxicity across this group. Um, MD Anderson have a study which they presented the toxicity data for in. Uh, uh, I think in, in ESMO uh, last year, um, they did they reportedly reported efficacy data, but I don't have access to that. Forty four percent response uh, grade three events. So summary of immune checkpoint inhibitors is that we are clearly seeing much lower response rates compared, but similar toxicity compared to cutaneous melanoma. But we do see occasional exceptional responders and identifying the biomarkers that might identify those patients is, is going to be an important step in terms of progressing immunotherapy. A couple of other novel approaches, 
Um, we've already heard about IMT GP100 extensively today. In the interest of time, I'll skip over most of the details here. Um, they, I guess, prolonged a couple of PRs in this with very long durations of response. Um, whether this is modifying the disease biology for the non-responders as well, leading to such good long-term uh, one-year overall survival rates, or whether these are patients who actually have quite unusual biology. A lot of these are highly pre-treated patients, four lines of previous therapy in a lot of them, suggesting maybe these are patients who have indolent disease. Um, we have a phase two study open in three sites in Australia, one across the road under Josh, uh, Anthony and then Michael Brown, who will be speaking later oh, next, um, has it open at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. We've got it open at Peter Mac as well. And then lastly, adoptive TILs. Um, metastectomies, expanding inf uh, the immune cells and then reinfusing it into patients. They've been doing this at the uh, NCI in Bethesda. They've re recently reported results with 21 patients with some interesting results, so seven responders. Um, median response can be quite short, although one exceptional responder here. Um, so in conclusion, there's been a lot of difficult, uh, difficulty developing evidence for treatment in rare cancers like uveal melanomas. Efficacy of existing immuno, immune checkpoint inhibitors is much lower but has similar toxicity and we're going to need novel strategies and drug combinations in order to progress this. Uh, clinical trials remain standard of care, so we really need people to refer to those centres that are holding clinical trials in this space. Thank you.